Chapter Sixteen of the Golden Dream. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Dream by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Sixteen. Ned and Tom take to wandering. Philosophical speculations. A startling apparition. The Digger Indians water boiled in a basket, the gloomy pass, the attack by robbers, the fight, a surprise, the encampment. Change is one of the laws of nature. We refer not to small change, reader, but to physical material change. Everything is given to change. Men and things and place and circumstances all change, more or less as time rolls on in its endless course. Following, then, this inevitable law of nature, we, too, will change the scene, and convey our reader deeper in among the plains and mountains of the far, far west. It is a beautiful evening in July. The hot season has not yet succeeded in burning up all nature into a dry russet brown. The whole face of the country is green and fresh after a recent shower, which has left myriads of diamond drops trembling from the point of every leaf and blade. A wide valley of a noble park-like appearance is spread out before us, with scattered groups of trees all over it, blue mountain ranges in the far distance circling round it, and a bright stream winding down its emerald breast. On the hillsides the wild flowers grow so thickly that they form a soft, thick couch to lie upon. Immense trees, chiefly pines and cedars, rise here and there like giants above their fellows. Oaks, too, are numerous, and the scene in many places is covered with manzanita underwood, a graceful and beautiful shrub. The trees and shrubbery, however, are not so thickly planted as to intercept the view, and the ground undulates so much that occasionally we overtop them, and obtain a glimpse of the wide vale before us. Over the whole landscape there is a golden sunny haze that enriches while it softens every object and the balmy atmosphere is laden with the sweet perfume called forth by the passing shower. One might fancy Eden to have been somewhat similar to this, and here, as there, the presence of the Lord might be recognized in a higher degree than in most other parts of this earth, for in this almost untrodden wilderness his preeminently beautiful works have not yet to any great extent been marred by the hand of man. Far away, towards the north, Two horsemen may be seen wending their way through the country at a slow, ambling pace, as if they would fain prolong their ride in such a lovely vale. The one is Ned Sinton, the other Tom Collins. It had cost these worthies a week of steady riding to reach the spot on which we now find them, during which time they had passed through great varieties of scenery, had seen many specimens of digging life, and had experienced not a few vicissitudes but their griefs were few and slight compared with their enjoyments, and at the moment we overtake them they were riding they knew not, and they cared not, whither. Sufficient for them to know that the wilds before them were illimitable, that their steeds were of the best and fleetest Mexican breed, that their purses were well lined with dollars and gold dust, that they were armed with rifles, pistols, knives, and ammunition to the teeth, and that the land was swarming with game. "'Tis a perfect paradise!' exclaimed Tom Collins, as they reined up on the brow of a hill to gaze at the magnificent prospect before them. "'Strange,' murmured Ned, half soliloquizing, "'that although so wild and uncultivated, it should remind me so forcibly of home. Yonder bend in the stream and the scenery round it is so like the spot where I was born and where I spent my earliest years that I can almost fancy the old house will come into view at the next turn.' It does indeed remind one of the cultivated parks of England, replied Tom, but almost all my early associations are connected with cities. I have seen little of uncontaminated nature all my life, except the blue sky through chimney tops, and even that was seen through a medium of smoke. Do you know, remarked Ned as they resumed their journey at a slow pace, it has always seemed to me that cities are unnatural monstrosities, and that there should be no such things. Indeed, replied Tom, laughing, how then would you have men to live? In the country, of course, in cottages and detached houses. I would sow London, Liverpool, Manchester, etc., 
broadcast over the land, so that there would be no spot in Britain in which there were not clusters of human dwellings, each with its little garden around it, and yet no spot on which a city could be found. Hmm. Rather awkward for the transaction of business, I fear, suggested Tom. Not a bit. Our distances would be greater, but we could overcome that difficulty by using horses more than we do, and railroads. "'And how would you manage with huge manufactories?' inquired Tom. "'I've not been able to solve that difficulty yet,' replied Ned, smiling. "'But my not being able to point out how things may be put right "'does not in the least degree alter the fact that, as they are at present, they are wrong.' "'Most true, my sagacious friend,' said Tom. "'But pray, how do you prove the fact that things are wrong?' "'I prove it thus.' You admit, I suppose, that the air of all large cities is unhealthy, as compared with that of the country, and that men and women who dwell in cities are neither so robust nor so healthy as those who dwell in country places. I'm not sure that I do admit it, answered Tom. Surely you don't deny that people of the cities deem it a necessary of life to get off to the country at least once a year in order to recruit, and that they invariably return better in health than when they left. True but that is the result of change. Aye, added Ned, the result of change from worse to better. Well, I admit it for the sake of argument. Well, then, if the building of cities necessarily and inevitably creates a condition of atmosphere which is, to some extent, no matter how slight, prejudicial to health, those who build them and dwell in them are knowingly damaging the life which has been given them to be cherished and taken care of. Ned, said Tom quietly. You're a goose. Tom, retorted Ned, I know it. But in the sense in which you apply the term, all men are geese. They are divided into two classes, namely, geese who are such because they can't and won't listen to reason, and geese who are such because they take the trouble to talk philosophically to the former. But to return from this digression, what think you of the argument? Tom replied by reining up his steed, pointing to an object in front and inquiring, "'What think you of that?' The object referred to was a man, but, in appearance at least, he was not many degrees removed from the monkey. He was a black, squat, hideous-looking native, and his whole costume, besides the little strip of cloth usually worn by natives round the loins, consisted of a black silk hat and a pair of Wellington boots.' Dear reader, do not suppose that I am trying to impose upon your good-natured credulity. What I state is a fact, however unlikely it may appear in your eyes. The natives of this part of the country are called digger Indians, not with reference to gold digging, but from the fact of their digging subterranean dwellings in which they pass the winter, and also from the fact that they grub in the earth a good deal for roots on which they partly subsist. They are degraded, miserable creatures, and altogether uncivilized, besides being diminutive in stature. Soon after the first flood of gold hunters swept over their lands, these poor creatures learned the value of gold, but they were too lazy to work diligently for it. They contented themselves with washing out enough to purchase a few articles of luxury, in the shape of cast-off apparel from the white men. When stores began to be erected here and there throughout the country, they visited them to purchase fresh provisions and articles of dress, of which latter they soon became passionately fond. But the Digger Indians were not particular as to style or fashion. Glitter and gay color were the chief elements of attraction. Sometimes a naked savage might be seen going about with a second-hand dress coat put on the wrong way and buttoned up the back. Another would content himself with a red silk handkerchief tied round his head or shoulders. A third would thrust his spindle shanks through the arms of a sleeved vest and button the body round his loins, while a fourth, like the one now under consideration, would parade about in a hat and boots. The poor digger had drawn the right boot on the left foot and the left boot on the right, a matter of little moment, however, as they were immensely too large for him, as was also the hat, which only remained on his brows by being placed very much back on the head. He was a most singular being, and Ned and Tom, after the first glance of astonishment, were so unmannered as to laugh at him until they almost fell off their horses. The digger was by no means disconcerted. 
He evidently was accustomed to the free and easy manners of white men, and while they rolled in their saddles he stood quietly beside them, grinning hideously from ear to ear. "'Truly a rare specimen of humanity,' cried Ned when he recovered his composure. "'Where did you come from, old boy?' The digger shook his head and uttered some unintelligible words. "'It's of no use speaking to him. He don't understand English,' said Tom Collins, with a somewhat puzzled expression. The two friends made several attempts to ask him by signs where he lived, but they utterly failed. Their first efforts had the effect of making the man laugh, but their second attempts, being more energetic and extravagant, frightened him so that he manifested a disposition to run away.' This disposition they purposely encouraged until he fairly took to his heels, and by following him they at last came upon the village in which his tribe resided. Here they found an immense assemblage of men and women and children, whose appearance denoted dirtiness, laziness, and poverty. They were almost all in a state bordering on nudity, but a few of them wore miscellaneous portions of European apparel. The hair of the men was long, except on the forehead, where it was cut square just above the eyebrows. The children wore no clothes at all. The infants were carried on stiff cradles similar to those used by North American Indians. They all resided in tents made of brushwood and sticks, and hundreds of mangy, half-starved curs dwelt along with them. The hero of the hat and boots was soon propitiated by the gift of a few inches of tobacco, and Ned Sinton and Tom Collins were quickly on intimate terms with the whole tribe. It is difficult to resist the tendency to laugh when a human being stands before you in a ludicrously meager costume making hideous grimaces with his features and remarkable contortions with his limbs in the vain efforts to make himself understood by one who does not speak his language. Ned's powers of endurance were tested in this way by the chief of the tribe, an elderly man with a beard so sparse that each stumpy hair might have been easily counted. This individual was clad in the rough, ragged blue coat usually worn by Irish laborers of the poorest class. It was donned with the tails in front, and two brass buttons, the last survivors of a once glittering double row, fastened it across the back of its savage owner. "'What can he mean?' said Ned at the close of a series of pantomimic speeches, in which the Indian vainly endeavored to get him to understand something having reference to the mountains beyond for he pointed repeatedly towards them. "'It seems to me that he would have us understand,' said Tom, "'that the road lies before us, and the sooner we take ourselves off, the better.' Ned shook his head. "'I don't think that likely. He seems rather to wish us to remain. More than once he has pointed to his tent and beckoned us to enter.' "'Perhaps the old fellow wants us to become members of his tribe,' suggested Tom. "'Evidently he cannot lead his braves in the warpath as he was wont to do, and he wishes to make you chief in his room. "'What, thank you. Shall we remain? The blue coat would suit you admirably.' During this colloquy the old savage looked from one speaker to another with great eagerness, as if trying to comprehend what they said. Then, renewing his gesticulations, he succeeded at last in convincing the travellers that he wished them not to pursue their journey any further in the direction in which they were going. This was a request with which they did not, however, feel disposed to comply. But seeing that he was particularly anxious that they should accept of his hospitality, they dismounted, and fastening their horses to a tree close beside the opening of the chief's hut, they entered. The inside of this curious beehive of a dwelling was dirty and dark, besides being half full of smoke created by the pipe of a squaw, the old man's wife, who regaled herself there with the soothing weed. There were several dogs there also, and two particularly small infants in wooden cradles, who were tied up like mummies and did nothing but stare right before them into space. "'What's that?' inquired Tom, pointing to a basket full of smoking water. "'It looks like a basket,' replied Ned. "'It is a basket,' remarked Tom, examining the article in question. "'And as I live, superb soup in it.' "'Tom,' said Ned Sinton solemnly, "'have a care. "'If it is soup, depend upon it. "'Dogs or rats form the basis of its composition.' "'Ned,' said Tom with equal solemnity, "'eat and ask no questions.' Tom followed his own advice by accepting a dish of soup with a large lump of meat in it, which was at that moment offered to him by the old chief, who also urged Ned Sinton to partake, 
but he declined, and, lighting his pipe, proceeded to enjoy a smoke, at the same time handing the old man a plug of tobacco, which he accepted promptly and began to use forthwith. While thus engaged, they had an opportunity of observing how the squall boiled water in a basket. Laying aside her pipe, she hauled out a goodly-sized and very neatly made basket of wicker work, so closely woven by her own ingenious hands that it was perfectly water-tight. This she three-quarters filled, and then put into it red-hot stones, which she brought in from a fire kindled outside. The stones were thrown in, in succession, until the temperature was raised to the boiling point, and afterwards a little dead animal was put into the basket. The sight of this caused Tom Collins to terminate his meal somewhat abruptly, and induced Ned to advise him to try a little more. "'No, thank you,' replied Tom, lighting his pipe hastily, and taking up a bow and several arrows, which he appeared to regard with more than usual interest. The bow was beautifully made, rather short, and tipped with horn. The arrows were formed of two distinct pieces of wood spliced together, and were shod with flint. They were feathered in the usual way. All the articles manufactured by these natives were neatly done, and evinced considerable skill in the use of their few and simple tools. After resting half an hour, the two friends rose to depart, and again the old Indian manifested much anxiety to prevail on them to remain. But resisting all his entreaties, they mounted their horses and rode away, carrying with them the good wishes of the community by the courtesy of their manners and a somewhat liberal distribution of tobacco at parting the country through which they passed became wilder at every step for each hour brought them visibly nearer the mountain range and towards nightfall they entered one of the smaller passes or ravines that divided the lower range of hills at which they first arrived here a rugged precipice from which projected pendant rocks and scrubby trees, rose abruptly on the right of the road, and a dense thicket of underwood mingled with huge masses of fallen rock lay on their left. We use the word road advisedly, for the broad highway of the flowering plains over which the horsemen had just passed narrowed at this spot as it entered the ravine, and was a pretty well-defined path, over which parties of diggers and wandering Indians occasionally passed. "'Does not this wild spot remind you of the nursery tales we used to read?' said Ned, as they entered the somewhat gloomy defile, which used to begin once upon a time. Psst, Ned, is that a grizzly?' Both riders drew up abruptly and grasped their rifles. "'I hear nothing,' whispered Ned. "'It must have been imagination,' said Tom, throwing his rifle carelessly over his left arm, as they again advanced." The gloom of the locality, which was deepened by the rapidly gathering shades of night, quieted their spirits and induced them to ride on in silence. About fifty yards further on the rustling in the bushes was again heard, and both travellers pulled up and listened intently. "'Pshaw!' cried Ned at last, urging his horse forward and throwing his piece on his shoulder. "'We are starting at the rustling of the night wind. Come, come, Tom, don't let us indulge superstitious feelings.' At that moment there was a crash in the bushes on both sides of them, and their horses reared wildly as four men rushed upon them. Before their steeds became manageable, they were each seized by a leg and hurled from their saddles. In the fall their rifles were thrown out of their grasp into the bushes, but this mattered little, for in a close struggle pistols are better weapons. Seizing their revolvers, Ned and Tom instantly sprang up and fired at their assailants, but without effect both being so much shaken by their fall. The robbers returned the fire, also without effect. In the scuffle Ned was separated from his friend, and only knew that he maintained the fight manfully from the occasional shots that were fired near him. His whole attention, however, had to be concentrated on the two stalwart ruffians with whom he was engaged. Five or six shots were fired at a few yards' distance, quick as lightning, yet, strange to say, all missed. Then the taller of the two opposed to Ned, hurled his revolver full in his face and rushed at him. The pistol struck Ned on the chest and almost felled him, but he retained his position and met the highwayman with a well-directed blow of his fist right between the eyes. Both went down under the impetus of the rush, and the second robber immediately sprang upon Ned and seized him by the throat. But he little knew the strength of the man with whom he had to deal. 
our hero caught him in the iron grasp of his right hand, while with his left he hurled aside the almost inanimate form of his first assailant. Then, throwing the other on his back, he placed his knee on his chest and drew his bowie knife. Even in the terrible passion of mortal combat, Ned shuddered at the thought of slaying a helpless opponent. He threw the knife aside and struck the man violently with his fist on the forehead, and then sprang up to rescue Tom, who, although he had succeeded at the outset in felling one of the robbers with the butt of his pistol, was still engaged in doubtful strife with a man of great size and power. When Ned came up, the two were down on their knees, each grasping the other's wrist in order to prevent their bowie knives from being used. Their struggles were terrible, for each knew that the first who freed his right hand would instantly take the other's life. Ned settled the matter, however, by again using his fist, which he applied so promptly to the back of the robber's neck that he dropped as if he had been shot. "'Thank you. God bless you, Ned,' gasped Tom as soon as he recovered breath. "'You have saved my life, for certainly I could not have held out a minute longer. The villain has all but broken my right arm.' "'Never mind,' cried Ned, stooping down and turning the stunned robber over on his face. "'Give me a hand, boy.' We must not let the fellows recover and find themselves free to begin the work over again. Take that fellow's neckcloth and tie his hands behind his back. Tom obeyed at once, and in a few minutes the four highwaymen were bound hand and foot and laid at the side of the road. Now, said Ned, we must push on to the nearest settlement, hot haste, and bring a party out to escort. Hello? Tom, are you wounded? Not badly. A mere cut on the head. Why— your face is all covered with blood. It's only in consequence of my wiping it with a bloody handkerchief, then. But you can examine and satisfy yourself. The wound is but slight, I see, rejoined Ned after a brief manipulation of Tom's skull. Now then, let us away. We'll have to catch our horses first, and that won't be an easy matter. Tom was right. It cost them half an hour to secure them and recover their rifles and other arms, which had been scattered over the field of battle. On returning to the spot where the robbers lay, they found them all partially recovered and struggling violently to free themselves. Three of them failed even to slacken their bonds, but the fourth, the powerful man who had nearly overcome Tom Collins, had well nigh freed his hands when his captors came up. "'Lie quiet,' said Ned in a low tone if you don't want the butt of my rifle on your skull. The man lay down instantly. Tom, go and cut a stake six feet long, and I'll watch these fellows till you come back. The stake was soon brought and lashed to the robber's back in such a manner that he was rendered utterly powerless. The others were secured in a similar manner, and then the two travelers rode forward at a gallop. For nearly an hour they continued to advance without speaking or drawing rein. At the end of that time, while sweeping round the jutting base of a precipitous rock, they almost ran into a band of horsemen who were trotting briskly towards them. Both parties halted and threw forward their rifles, or drew their revolvers for instant use, gazing at each other the while in silent surprise at the suddenness of their meeting. "'Give in, ye villains!' at last shouted a stern voice, "'or we'll blow ye out of the saddle. You've no chance. Down your arms, I say!' "'Not until I know what right you have to command us,' replied Ned, somewhat nettled at the overbearing tone of his opponent. "'We are peaceable travellers desiring to hurt no one. But if we were not, surely so large a party need not be afraid. We don't intend to run away, still less do we intend to dispute your passage.' The strangers lowered their firearms as if half ashamed at being surprised into a state of alarm by two men. "'Who said we were afraid, young man?' continued the first speaker, riding up with his comrades and eyeing the travellers narrowly. "'Where have you come from, and how comes it that your clothes are torn and your face is covered with blood?' The party of horsemen edged forward as he spoke in such a manner as to surround the two friends, but Ned, although he observed the movement, was unconcerned as, from the looks of the party, he felt certain they were good men and true." "'You are a close interrogator for a stranger,' he replied. "'Perhaps you will inform me where you have come from, "'and what is your errand in these lonesome places at this hour of the night.' "'I'll tell you what it is, stranger,' answered another of the party, "'a big, insolent sort of fellow. 
We are out after a band of scoundrels that have infested them parts for a long time, and it strikes me you know more about them than we do. Perhaps you are right, answered Ned. Mayhap they're not very far off from where we're standing, continued the man, laying his hand on Tom Collins' shoulder. Tom gave him a look that induced him to remove the hand. Right again, rejoined Ned with a smile. I know where the villains are, and I'll lead you to them in an hour if you choose to follow me. The men looked at each other in surprise. You'll not object to some of us riding before and some behind you, said the second speaker, just by way of preventing your horses from running away. They looks a little skeery. By no means, answered Ned. Lead on, but keep off the edge of the track till I call a halt. Why so, stranger? Never mind, but do as I bid you. The tone in which this was said effectually silenced the man, and during the ride no further questions were asked. About a quarter of an hour afterwards the moon rose, and they advanced at such a rapid pace that in a short time they were close upon the spot where the battle had taken place. Just before reaching it, Ned called a halt and directed the party to dismount and follow him on foot. Although a good deal surprised, they obeyed without question, for our hero possessed, in an eminent degree, the power of constituting himself a leader among those with whom he chanced to come into contact. Fastening his horse to a tree, Ned led the men forward a hundred yards. "'Are these the men you search for?' he inquired. "'They are, sir,' exclaimed one of the party in surprise, as he stooped to examine the features of the robbers who lay where they had been left. "'Hello!' exclaimed Tom Collins. "'I say!' The biggest fellow's gone. Didn't we lay him hereabouts? Ah, uh, dear me, yes. Why, this is the very spot, I do believe. All further remarks were checked at that moment by the sound of horses' hoofs approaching, and almost before any one could turn round, a horseman came thundering down the pass at full gallop. Uttering a savage laugh of derision, he discharged his pistol full into the center of the knot of men as he passed, and in another moment was out of sight. Several of the onlookers had presence of mind enough to draw their pistols and fire at the retreating figure, but apparently without effect. "'It's him!' cried Tom Collins. "'And he's mounted on your horse, Ned!' "'After him, lads!' shouted Ned as he ran back towards the place where the horses were fastened. "'Whose is the best horse?' "'Hold on, stranger,' said one of the men as he ran up to Ned. "'You may save your wind. "'None of the horses can overtake your one, I guess. "'I was looking at him as we came along. "'It would only be losing time for nothing, and he's miles ahead by this time.' "'Ned Sinton felt that the man's remarks were too true, "'so he returned to the spot where the remaining robbers lay "'and found that the miners had cut their fastenings "'and were busily engaged in rebinding their hands behind them.' preparatory to carrying them back to their settlement. It was discovered that the lashings of one of the men had been partly severed with a knife, and, as he could not have done it himself, it was plain that the robber who had escaped must have done it, and that the opportune arrival of the party had prevented him from accomplishing his purpose. How the man had broken his own bonds was a mystery that could not now be solved, but it was conjectured that they must have been too weak, and that he had burst them by main strength. Another discovery was now made, namely, that one of the three robbers secured was no other than Black Jim himself. The darkness of the night had prevented Ned and Tom from making this discovery during the fight. In less time than we have taken to describe it, the robbers were secured, and each was mounted behind one of his captors. "'Ain't you going with us?' inquired one of the men, observing that Ned Sinton stood leaning on his rifle as if he meant to remain behind. No, answered Ned, my companion and I have traveled far today, besides fighting a somewhat tough battle. We mean to camp here for the night and shall proceed to your settlement tomorrow. The men endeavored to dissuade them from their purpose, but they were both fatigued and persisted in their determination. The impression they had made, however, on their new friends was so favorable that one of their number, a Yankee, offered the loan of his horse to Ned, an offer which the latter accepted thankfully promising to return it safe and sound early on the following day. Five minutes later the sound of the retreating hooves died away, and the travelers stood silently side by side in the gloomy ravine. For a few minutes neither spoke, 
Then Ned heaved a sigh, and looking in his companion's face with a serio-comically sad expression, said, "'It may not perhaps have occurred to you, Tom, but are you aware that we are a couple of beggars?' "'If you use the term in its slang sense and mean to insinuate that we are a couple of unfortunate beggars, I agree with you.' "'Well, I've no objection,' rejoined Ned, "'to your taking my words in that sense. "'But I mean to say that, over and above that, "'we are real, veritable, bona fide beggars, "'inasmuch as we have not a sixpence in the world.' "'Tom Collins's visage grew exceedingly long. "'Our united purse,' pursued Ned, "'hung, as you are aware, at my saddle-bow.' and yon unmitigated villain who appropriated my good steed is now in possession of all our hard-earned gold. Tom's countenance became preternaturally grave, but he did not venture to speak. Now, continued Ned, forcing a smile, there is nothing for it but to make for the nearest diggings, commence work again, and postpone our travels to a future and more convenient season. We may laugh at it as we please, my dear fellow, but there's no denying that we are in what the Yankees would call an uncommon fix. Ned's remark as to laughing at it was altogether uncalled for and inappropriate, for his own smile might have been more correctly termed a grin, and nothing was further from Tom Collins's thoughts at that moment than laughing. Are the vittles gone too? inquired Ned hastily. Both turned their eyes toward Tom Collins' horse, which grazed hard by, and both heaved a sigh of relief on observing that the saddlebags were safe. This was a small drop of comfort in their otherwise bitter cup, and they made the most of it, each, as if by a common impulse, pretending that he cared very little about the matter, and assuming that the other stood in need of being cheered and comforted, went about the preparations for encamping with a degree of reckless joviality that insensibly raised their spirits, not only up to but considerably above the natural level, and when at last they had spread out their viands and lighted their fire in their pipes, they were, according to Tom's assertion, happy as kings. The choosing of a spot to encamp on formed the subject of an amicable dispute. "'I recommend the level turf under this oak,' said Ned, pointing to a huge old tree, whose gnarled limbs covered a wide space of level sward. "'It's too low,' objected Tom. Tom could always object, a quality which, while it acted like an agreeable dash of cayenne thrown into the conversation of some of his friends, proved to be sparks applied to gunpowder in that of others. "'It's too low, and doubtless moist.' I think that yonder pine, with its spreading branches and sweet-smelling cones and carpet of moss below, is a much more fitting spot. Now, who is to decide the question if I don't give in, Tom? For I assume, of course, that you will never give in. At that moment an accident occurred which decided the question for them. It frequently happens that some of the huge, heavy branches of the oaks in America become so thoroughly dried and brittle by the intense heat of summer that they snap off without a moment's warning, often when there is not a breath of air sufficient to stir a leaf. This propensity is so well known to Californian travelers that they are somewhat careful in selecting their camping ground, yet, despite all their care, an occasional life is lost by the falling of such branches." An event of this kind occurred at the present time. The words had barely passed Ned's lips when a large limb of the oak beside which they stood snapped off with a loud report and fell with a crash to the ground. "'That settles it,' said Tom somewhat seriously as he led his horse towards the pine tree and proceeded to spread his blanket beneath its branches. In a few minutes the bright flame of their campfire threw a lurid glare on the trees and projecting cliffs of the wild pass, while they cooked and ate their frugal meal of jerked beef and biscuit. They conversed little during the repast or after it, for drowsiness began to steal over them, and it was not long before they laid their heads side by side on their saddles, and murmuring, "'Good night,' forgot their troubles in the embrace of deep, refreshing slumber. End of chapter 16